This is Self Startup. Welcome, folks, to season two of Self Startup. This is a podcast that highlights the small business owners, the self employed, and freelancers who have taken the plunge to create their own desirable lifestyle. My name is Andy Dowling. I'm also the host of the Andy Social Podcast, and I play bass in the Australian metal band Lord. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by searching at Andy Dowling, or you can go to selfstarter.com.au where you can learn more about yours truly, as well as anything and everything to do with the self employment world. This episode is with music social media marketer Monica Strutt. Monica could be seen as a first aid specialist when it comes to musicians, social media, and digital marketing. Responding to the call of bands who are in crisis and needing consulting and support, Monica is providing her expertise to help musicians succeed in the often murky waters of the music industry and online marketing. Now, from personal experiences, starting out on your own is really tough, especially when you're branding yourself as a product or service. Monica made the decision, however, to put her name and personal reputation on the line rather than utilizing a business name. No doubt, it would have been a daunting decision for her, but it's brought Monica many advantages, which includes creating a relatable, trustworthy resource for people who are on the hunt for help, and it's also building her own profile as a subject matter expert within the industry. As a musician herself, Monica has seen the mistakes made firsthand and watched as peers have given up on their music pursuits. Monica is using these real-life experiences to create tangible resources and tools for others. She's also using these experiences as a personal and professional compass to ensure that her goals to impact and help others are always in sight and in focus. In our chat, Monica talks about how she's been taking a measured approach when it comes to building her business, managing it all on the side of a day job, how she got started with consulting and how her decisions to invest heavily in herself, such as using business coaches, has impacted her success to date. It's a daunting journey, but as Monica shows, you don't have to do it all on your own. To learn more about Monica Strutt and her world of social media marketing, check out monicastrutt.com or you can check out the show notes over at selfstarter.com.au. For now though, please enjoy this really inspiring chat with Monica Strutt. What's up? I'm Monica Strutt and I am a music marketing and business consultant for emerging heavy bands. That's a nice, concise uh, little pitch for your, for your business. That's really cool. Have you been working on that at all? Uh, well, it is a little bit hard to kind of, I guess, summarize what I do because I am a music journalist as well and I'm a musician. So I was actually at Big Sound last week and I find it's a little bit situational how I introduce myself, but that's kind of the main thing that I go with. I found that's something that I've learned along the way where – especially in this day and age where we've got so many different options at our fingertips and technology where we can do lots of different things and we don't have to just go on the one career path and just stick at that. And that's our identity. We can, we can adjust and be, and, and flex in different areas. So depending on your audience, you can pitch it in a number of different ways, depending on, I guess, what, the, what the goal is. Yeah, definitely. And um, it, it took me a bit to get used to as well, especially, you know, being a musician and then transitioning over into the business world. It was kind of a bit of a weird thing because I always introduced myself as a vocalist of whatever band I was in at the time. And yeah, just uh, I guess it does depend on the situation though. So a little bit of that OG story. What, I guess, what's that background? Obviously there's music in, in the background there, but what was sort of the the path leading up to you making the decision that you wanted to, I guess, branch out and have this extra, extra element of, of, of who you are in golf and on this more sort of business direction. Yeah. So when, um, my last band that I was in, uh, we were together for six years and then we decided to part ways. I kind of recognized that I needed to upskill and I transitioned into kind of the digital marketing sort of world and started working for a, um, heavy magazine as a social media manager. I was already 
working as a music journalist before that, but wasn't really taking it so seriously. And then when I had learned, I suppose, enough after a couple of years of doing that, I noticed that I was starting to get a lot of questions from bands that I knew, bands that I didn't know as well, um, completely outside my network. I was getting hit up in the DMs all the time asking <laughs> for social media advice uh, for bands. So I then, I always knew that I wanted to work within the music industry as well, because obviously my first love is music, so why not? Um, I also you know, wanted a job that I could do, which was sort of flexible in terms of around touring and everything like that. And so, and so, yeah, I started a YouTube channel and was giving out advice on there for a little while. And then I thought I was actually approached by a band to do consulting and then, um, yeah, it kind of just happened organically from there and yeah it's sort of all I'm not going to say it fell in my lap because there was definitely some intention behind it but uh, that was sort of the beginning of um, my business. So when when you got approached by that band to do some consulting work had I mean obviously you were answering answering questions for bands and it, whether they be within your network and or otherwise but had you had you thought that this potentially could be an avenue that you could go down or was that moment where someone approached you and 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 gave you this opportunity that you thought, me? Like, why me? Like, did you have that sort of moment of like almost that imposter syndrome of going, oh, do I, do I take this step and, and be seen as somebody with the expertise that I can now consult a band? Yeah, not at that stage. I definitely suffered with imposter syndrome when I decided to kind of officially launch my business under my name. This was sort of a few months or six months or so before that. Um, at that stage, I was just like, happy to be paid to sit with a band and tell them all about social media and I was like okay well if I can if one band wants me to do this then obviously other bands want me to do it but I've definitely procrastinated for a really really long time I um, was originally going to launch the business under a business name as opposed to my own name because once again there was kind of this conflict in my head between myself as a musician and uh, you know the business so Yes, I think when I decided to kind of go all in and just do it under my name because I'd over many, many years built up this network on social media and beyond under my own name and that kind of made sense to launch under that name, especially because I was writing under that name as well. Um, then that's when the imposter syndrome kind of set in um, because it is quite confronting to kind of have a business under your name and people are hiring you as a person and every, everything reflects, uh, essentially you have to sell yourself. It's much harder than selling, you know, a third party like name, like a band or a business or something. But, um, but yeah, that was kind of that transition. Did you, did you have any experience in the past of, going down this path of, of, of being self-employed, did you, or did you ever have thoughts of ever going down the self-employment path? Yeah. I mean, I always wanted to be self-employed. I just didn't quite know how that was going to happen. My dad has always been uh, a kind of consultant, a project manager. So I really, really liked the lifestyle that he's had. He had, sorry. Uh, he was able to travel and whatnot. So, but I didn't quite work it out. I, kind of all roads were kind of leading to this point, um, being a sort of marketing and business consultant for bands, but it definitely took me a while to kind of realize that consciously. I thought, I mean, I always thought that I'd quit my day job and be a musician full time, but I kind of realized that that is a really, really long journey. <laughs> it's a long way to the top. Uh, so I knew that if I wanted to have the freedom that I desired, I kind of had to figure out something else that would also support that common goal. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't know exactly how it would happen, but I eventually figured it out. What was, what was the planning like when you're sort of leading up to this moment, even, even that six months between doing that first bit of consulting work and, you know, moving forward and, and eventually launching, launching your brand, your business, what, what sort of planning did you have to think about and, and, you know, just work on behind the scenes before you were able to sort of, you know, let, let the world know what you're going to do? Yeah. So I kind of got hooked on entrepreneurial YouTube videos. So I <laughs> loved YouTube at the time. I still do, but now I'm sort of more getting into podcasts. So I was watching a lot of, um, a lot of girls doing what, you know, having this lifestyle where they could kind of work from a laptop wherever that old cliche. And, um, but I was particularly following a couple of them that went really, really sort of in depth about their business and how they actually earned money, what kind of products and services they offered, uh, what they did day to day. And 
I was kind of fascinated by it. So I did have kind of months or even I'd been watching that, uh, you know, that sort of content and absorbing that sort of content for even a year before I started my business. And that was pretty much the, um, the, the sort of training, the background that I got before I started. Um, but a few months into my business, I actually did hire a business coach who was one of the girls off YouTube, which was really cool. And, um, I did a group coaching program for a couple of months and that was so invaluable because I think, you know, when you're just starting, especially you're kind of just, you know, you're always figuring it out as you go along, but, I feel like, especially if you're a content creator, there's kind of a lot of this shiny object syndrome and working with a business coach and working in a group setting where I had a bunch of people that could kind of um, support me and we could support each other was so invaluable because it kind of kept me focused. Um, Otherwise, (laughs) um, I don't know, there's a lot of people that probably do this too, but for me in particular, I kind of tend to get a bit unfocused and um, don't really complete projects. So (laughs) it was good to have that at the start. I've seen uh, a fair few examples now. Just and I've had one example on on this podcast in this series where um, I was a hairdresser from Wollongong, and uh, she got a business coach to to get involved and and help her get out of a rut and and just relook mm. at her her business and her structure and and made such a such a dramatic difference to her. And I think there's so much value in investing in having somebody come in with some expertise and guide you and you know people say you know you could use the term mentors as well but um i think sometimes one of the biggest challenges that we a lot of us have especially when we're you know we we want to go down that self-employment journey it's we want to do everything ourselves we think mm-hmm. that we're we're on our own and we're the only person that can that can make it happen and you know there's an element of that and there's a an element of pride that comes with that as well but you definitely need to surround yourself with expertise, whether it be a business partner or whether it be somebody that you employ or it's somebody that can come in as a consultant for you to be able to look at what you do and give you advice and direction. So it's super cool because I didn't know that you'd, you'd actually done that. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people get scared off because I suppose it is still re- relatively new in the scheme of things. But the thing about having a coach or a consultant, um, you know, especially when you're going into business is – Uh, They can definitely save you time and money as well, even though it is quite an investment in, you know, up front. They can definitely save you time because essentially they've done it all before. And also they can, uh, they're really good at keeping you accountable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So if you're like someone like me who likes to procrastinate, then um, having that sort of guidance um, and support is really helpful. And also when you're an entrepreneur, I've found that a lot of the um, sort of positive and negative moments in business, they all kind of blur into one when you're doing things by yourself. So when you're kind of working by yourself, you don't have that team around you to kind of congratulate you if you've had, um, you know, if you've had a big win in the business, big, big or like or even just a small win sometimes. And um, likewise, if you're having sort of a shitty time, it's really hard for someone like, you know, maybe a romantic partner to kind of sympathize because they're not as involved as what you are. So having a business coach is really helpful as well in just, I guess, having someone to celebrate those good times and commiserate and support you with the bad times who fully understands and who's fully on that journey with you. So yeah, highly recommend it if anyone's thinking about it, but you've got to find the right person as well. That, that would be a challenge. And, and I know that, um, you know, from previous examples, you know, it, it might take a bit of time. It might take a bit of, you know, try, a bit of trial and error or just testing the water and asking a few questions to begin with just to suss out, you know, what people's backgrounds are and whether not so much that, you know, yes, there are charlatans out there and, and people that don't have, I guess, the, the substance to be able to help. But sometimes somebody's expertise and, and background just may not be completely suited to what you need as well. So there's a, there's a bit of, I guess, a little bit of uh, research and time that you have to put in up front, but um, I, I keep hearing it all the time. I see so many examples. And even for me now, personally, I think, huh, okay, maybe, maybe I'm getting enough uh, messages here that I might have to start looking at something myself because it's, it's, it seems to be uh, something that can provide so much impact. Yeah. And I have two things to add to that. So as I was mentioning, sometimes a financial investment um, can be a bit confronting for some people. Um, for my particular program, yes, it was, um, it wasn't like a, you know, you hear people paying $50,000 for mm. coaches. It was nothing, absolutely nothing like that. Um, 
However, the financial accountability, when you pay for something, there's just sort of this, um, you know, you it kind of makes you become serious very quickly and take it a lot more seriously than just consuming free information on the internet because everything's available for free on the internet. Like that's, you know, that's just a thing. And, um, but having that personalized, you know, contact with someone obviously, and also the financial investment, um, it's really, really good if you are at a stage where you really want to step up and take it more seriously. Um, but with research, um, so my coach, her name's Erin May Henry. She has a YouTube channel with over a hundred thousand subscribers and she's very transparent with the money that she makes in her business and stuff. So I'd actually been following her on social media for, or, gosh, I think a year or maybe 18 months or so before I committed to actually working with her. So that would be a suggestion for anyone that's looking for a coach is find someone who uh, you can kind of follow on social media for a while, get to know who they are as a person and consume all their free content. Because if you're getting a lot of value from their free content, imagine what their paid content is going to give. That's a good point. Very good point. Um, did you, did you have any particular challenges as you're getting ready to launch or even when you launched, like when you had that, that launch day where you, you finally put the name out there and said, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, come and check it out. Where did you have any, any sort of hurdles that you had to sort of overcome? Yeah, definitely. So I actually redid my website about three times mm. before I launched. So that's typical procrastination behavior or busy work as um, some people like to call it. So that's basically yeah, procrastinating and doing things that make you feel busy, but aren't actually moving you forward. Um, in saying that my first websites were pretty crap. So <laughs> I'm glad that I redid them. But um, yeah, the first few websites were under a completely different business name. And I remember just, it took me months, absolutely months to kind of get, the, get these websites up and running um, under this business name. And I couldn't quite figure out why. And then after, uh, I don't know, I would have, you know, kind of thought it over. I think I joined a membership program, which <laughs> kind of touched on the subject of what to call your business name, because I know that's a common question that a lot of people have is, should you call the business after yourself or should you have, you know, a different name? So it kind of made sense if I was going to do consulting to just have it under my own name. And, um, yeah, I finally committed to publishing a website under my name. I bought the domain name and bought, you know, the email address or whatever you do, the Google suite <laughs> package. And once again, just having that financial investment and that commitment was, um, okay, this is serious now. And it kind of, um, kind of gave me a bit of a boost. It was like one of those things that was scary, but, um, it also was like, well, I can't go back now because I've already bought the domain name and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, with the imposter syndrome, um, yeah, I think this is a lot of thing that a lot of early stage entrepreneurs go through and um, gosh, like I wouldn't even, there's just so many things that you can do to help the situation. But yeah, I guess the things that were running through my mind were um, because yeah, I don't know. I've never had a business before and I'd only had a couple of clients at that point and they were kind of like on the DL. So launching and um, having this official business and then I launched a blog and whatnot. I hadn't established myself, I guess, in that capacity. Everyone just kind of knew me as a vocalist, but then over time I've definitely become more confident as I've had the blog for about a year now and um, it's sort of growing more and more every day. But um yeah, it's, it's been a journey. <laughs> how, how important has that free content been as far as driving interest and paid, paid interest your way, as far as having the blog and now, now more recently uh, launching the podcast as well? Has that, has that been really valuable? Yeah, definitely. So I'm a huge believer in content marketing. Um, I think for anyone who's kind of looking to establish themselves as a thought leader in their industry, especially if you're trying something new, not a lot of people are. Um, doing marketing for musicians, at least not on a grassroots level. Um, so content marketing is so, so important, whether that be a blog, whether that be a podcast, whether that be a YouTube channel, you've got to have some sort of rich content platform in order to, I guess, establish your credibility. So um, back to what I was saying before is with my coach, I was consuming a lot of her free content on YouTube. And I was just thinking to myself, wow, like this is so valuable. And I consumed her free content for, as I said, over a year. And, um, 
in that time, I guess, you know, you establish this relationship with someone that you don't even know and it just kind of builds that no like and trust. So it's definitely, definitely been so important. Um, it is a commitment as well. I think if you're going to go the content marketing route, um, then it's a commitment of your time and it does take longer to be established. The other alternative is um, to do sort of paid advertising, Facebook ads and whatnot to try and drive traffic to your website and funnel in potential customers. Um, I'm not against Facebook ads at all. I just believe that slow and steady wins the race and I much rather have a small loyal fan base who are actually going to buy from me than just a bunch of sort of um, people that maybe don't know who I am and don't um, I guess have that relationship that I have with, um, the readers of my blog and whatnot. Um, plus obviously there's more of a financial investment up front. So, I mean, obviously different things work for different people. There's no way to no one way to do things, but yeah, I'm just such a firm believer in content marketing, especially if, you know, the central kind of, uh, crux of your business is educating people. I think, especially if you're passionate about a subject, you know, you want, you want to have every opportunity possible to be able to tell people all about it. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, in, in a traditionally professional sense either. It could be any interest that you have, you know, especially, especially with the internet these days, you can become, you know, an influencer or just be, as you said before, this key person that, 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 that you know, talks about a topic in, in the marketplace. It could be anything. And as long as you're passionate about it, you should be using every opportunity to talk about it and celebrate it. And you'll, the great thing about the internet is you're obviously going to pull in people that share similar interests to you or are looking for the same things that you're looking for or wanting to provide. So, um, as you said before, you don't need to win over the masses. You can have this loyal fan base and, and, ha and do the slow burn and be rewarded, uh, considerably in the long term because, you know, it's, I mean, we, we see it with the band, same sort of deal, you know, you're, you, you'd rather have a small group of people that are just will drop everything, invest in the band, pay for things, buy the next t-shirt that comes out or the CD or whatever it is and not, not have to question it. And they go out and they're, they're your marketing team as well. So instead of you trying to convince somebody who probably doesn't, you know, it needs a lot more convincing or a lot more money and resources to win them over. And you're not even guaranteed to retain them either. Absolutely. And it's really interesting lately because I'm kind of at a point where I've had the blog for a year as of last week. And, um, Happy birthday. <laughs> my thank you, my thank you very much. <laughs> um, and I've kind of, um, you know, when you start reaching more people, you automatically, uh, you, <sighs> as you grow your audience, you're naturally going to sort of experience haters on the internet. Mm. And um, that's just a normal part of business. And um, I'm very, very chill about it. Um, now, I think probably a year ago, I wouldn't have been, but I'm quite chill about it now. And um, it's really interesting though, because um, when, if I do get, you know, the very rare occasions, it's only like the 1%, um, the very rare occasions where I might post a slightly controversial blog article. I mean, I, post, I posted one last week that was basically saying, uh, that you know those people that share um, links to their music or events sort of mm. unsolicited in the DMs yes. <laughs> so I posted a whole um, podcast episode and blog about that and why it's essentially like being a telemarketer like being a daughter or salesman it's not effective marketing and um, I often share my posts in groups to try and I guess get the exposure for them and yeah this one guy was kind of going off he took it very very personally <laughs> and I've noticed <laughs> yeah, it was really funny he wrote like six comments in a row um, and um, yeah I've noticed that whenever something like that happens um, sort of lately that um, there'll be people that have um, been reading my content and that are I guess regular readers and they go into that for me and it's like quite interesting they'll sort of start defending me and be like if you knew Monica what she does blah 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 and um yeah I'm like at this point now where uh yeah that's starting to happen and I've seen that happen um I guess some of my friends have YouTube channels and whatnot and I was, I'm like wow that's you know that's sort of a milestone in the business so I'm not that I encourage <laughs> fights or anything in the comments but um, yeah, it makes me sort of proud of the community that I have built. And, um, thankfully the, for the most part, it's positive anyway. Well, a lot, a lot of the large, you know, corporations out there that have been transitioning into social media marketing, I mean, they pay 
mega dollars to try and create that sort of level of advocacy for within their own you know customer base you know you have these these organizations that will put things on on facebook for, just to use facebook as a platform example and you know they'll they'll have like any any business or anybody out there you'll have your your, your percentage of haters and what they hope and what they pay a lot of money for to try and try and, and i'll use air quotes organically create it is to get a level of dedicated advocates there that will get in and defend the brand without them having to get in there and, and awkwardly write a comment that's diplomatic without uh, you know being inappropriate or and maintaining professionalism they can post something and walk away and let let their followers um, deal with any of the any of the criticism that pops up but it is a very hard thing to do and um, and that's the benefit of being you know self-employed and, and starting from from nothing I mean, obviously, as you said before, you had this network and that's why you've gone with your name. You've got that reputation that you've already carved out as a musician, but, you know, as a business and a business owner, you've, you've had to start from, from nothing and create this really grassroots organic, uh, group of people. And that's something that's going to be, it's, it's priceless. It, it's absolutely priceless. And it'll continue to, to that, that oh, I was going to say, continue to add value, um, but it's already priceless. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And what I say to bands as well is fronting sometimes if you have an experienced um, sort of negative comments on your stuff, but um, polarization, it's, it's essential part of any business because if you try and be vanilla at the end of the day, you don't really, I guess you're not really anyone's cup of tea. <laughs> People are just going to move on. So with any sort of business that you in that you're in, you kind of want to not intentionally. I mean, some people intentionally <laughs> do it, but that polarization is a good thing because um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, people might not agree with what you're saying or the product that you're selling, but on the other end, that means that people are going to be diehard advocates for you and um and love what you're doing so that polarization is definitely a good thing it's a it's an easier way to connect with people and a quicker way i should say and it makes it more relatable to the people that you actually want to target you now there's, there's there's more there's more reasons that are spelt out in front of somebody to connect and relate where as you said before if you're a little bit more lukewarm and a little bit more uh you know um diluted in your approach then it's harder to get those people to, to jump on board and relate to what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, one thing I was going to ask you is when you launched, what were your products like? What, what sort of things were you looking to, to put out there as far as things that people could purchase as far as your services? Did you spend a lot of time thinking about this? And I, I would assume that it, there would be a difficulty in trying to measure that value as far as what sort of price points you put on it, what sort of value are you going to give people and the perception of that value as well? I mean, what sort of approach did you take to begin with? Yeah, so I kind of looked at my strengths. So I, um, you know, I love... Uh, chatting to people in sort of a group setting. I, you know, from the consulting that I'd already done before I officially launched, you know, I thought, um, you know, for example, we, um, one of the first bands that I worked with, we would meet up at a pub and we would have a couple of beers and I'd bring my laptop and it was just such a really fun, energetic setting. So I always knew that I loved the in-person stuff when it was, um, with a band, I quickly learned that the in-person stuff, often um, I had uh, sort of just one band member hire me as a consultant. And um, whilst I still enjoyed it, definitely, I realized after experiencing that, that it is much more fun when the whole band's there or there's a couple of people there, we can kind of bounce off that energy. Um, so I guess my sort of, um, my sort of thing has always been that I will first of all, know my strengths. <laughs> um, and secondly, I guess, just try things to see if they're going to work. So um, another thing I love is writing. So the I knew that I wanted to do courses and have sort of some passive income um, coming in that way. I also released a book as one of my first products, which was a course that I turned into a book. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much open to trying anything. I'm probably going to... <laughs> 
launch um, with someone else a um, 30 day challenge. Um, yeah, I'm just trying anything at the moment. And I think that, you know, I'm still fairly early, like into the business. I've only had it for about 18 months or so. So I'm just trying things now, but definitely um, for someone who's, you know, maybe not at that stage or about to launch, what are your strengths? I mean, if you're a really good talker, then, um, you know, see how you can organize um, some products around that, even, you know, stuff like a podcast or audio trainings and whatnot. But um, yeah, other than that, just try everything and see how you go. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the book's a great idea. And I think uh, it's obviously, obviously a very popular thing for a lot of people to do, especially in that self -im employment domain. Um, I think it's, it's never been easier to be able to, I mean, you, you know, if people are creating content online, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier than ever to be able to put that into some form of ebook or even a, even a tangible book now. And yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a really, it's a really powerful thing that would be easy. I would assume more easier to be able to put a value on it. But I guess, I guess the thing that's really interesting when it comes to consult consultant work is the and I, and I don't expect you to, to to dig into exactly what the pricing structure and things like that are but did you did you sort of spend a lot of time thinking about how you measured your time financially as far as what you charge people because obviously that's always going to change but did you was that a difficult thing to try and work out what what your value actually is and what people would be prepared to pay for Absolutely. Because when you go from being employed by an employer and um, I was sort of doing um, admin and marketing and there's definitely a cap on what you can earn per hour. So when I first got approached by the band, the first band that I worked with, I charged, I think it was a grand total of $5 more per hour than what I was being paid at my day job. And mm -hmm. I felt crazy. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I think it was like, gosh, like $35 an hour or something, which um, is a good wage when you're employed, but it's definitely, um, <laughs> it's about a third of what consultants get paid um, in probably less than that, even a sixth, or it de obviously depends. There's no cap, obviously, mm. when you're self-employed and how much experience you have and what your rates are and whatnot. Um, but yeah, when I <laughs> transitioned out of the per hour model and then into more of a package sort of deal, um, which was guided by the coach that I had. Um, once again, that kind of gave me a lot of confidence and sort of um, intel into what other people were doing into the industry because I hadn't really experienced that before. Um, then, yeah, I changed my business model and stopped sort of charging per hour and more charged on like a package thing. But, um, yeah, it's um, something that is um quite strange at first but um yeah you, you get used to it i guess and um there are yeah as i said some <laughs> crazy crazy fees that people charge for consulting and whatnot so um it's just a matter of knowing your market and kind of testing the waters as well my prices have raised um a little bit over um the past 18 months or so um but yeah that's it's definitely a tricky one when you're first starting out is it a challenge with musicians as well? I mean, I'm I'm going to be very unfair to all of our musician friends that, that are going to be listening to this, but there's there's been a stigma in a lot of circles where I guess it's the love of the music. It's that romantic vision of being in a band and, you know, you just help each other out and you don't really pay for much because you never have any money anyway. You're, a, you're <laughs> yeah. you know, you don't make money in music. So the the thought of spending money on on something that's more than your gear or your travel costs to get to the venue or printing, you know, merchandise or, or music or something like that. It, it seems for a lot of bands, uh, something that it will just never be thought about. It's just not something to, to think about. Have you found that breaking that stigma has been something that you've had to try and work on as well to show, like, as you said before, investing in yourself is a really important thing and spending some money up front, you might not get the tangible results straight away, but it, it's it's a it's a very worthwhile investment. Has that been something you've had to try and work on? Yeah, definitely. And that was absolutely a roadblock in terms of my personal mindset as well, because I know that musicians have so much to pay for. And um, you know, I really had to think to myself, like, what is a sort of you know, what do you charge in this situation? And it's still a new sort of um, offering within the music industry. I mean, there's definitely not a lot of consultants within Australia, especially, um, and 
not that many that I know of around the rest of the world that are kind of um, putting their personal brand out there and being a consultant, you know, as their job, as opposed to a manager who you can kind of email on the sly and ask if they can do some consulting with you. So it's still a relatively new part of the music industry. And that has definitely been tricky for me to navigate. And yeah, as I said, I'm a musician myself, so I know how many expenses there are. But um, in saying that, all it takes is a change in my, all it took, I guess, is a change in my mindset. And I had to think to myself, okay, when I was in a band for six years and I was so, so frustrated that I was feeling invisible and I was wondering why other bands who'd been around for less time were getting more opportunities, tour supports, um, we're getting, you know, hit up by managers left, right and centre, hit up by labels. And why was my band not? Yes, of course, I would have paid someone um, a couple of hundred bucks for a couple of consulting sessions to kind of save me all that, um, you know, all that confusion. So I had to kind of talk to myself in that way. And um, then when the time came that I did put my services out there and I did bundles of packages, six sessions with me or 12 sessions or whatever the case may be, um, and I experienced musicians paying me in full up front, um, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for those packages, which is, you know, I didn't expect that anyone would buy them. <laughs> well, I was like, I'll put it out there and I'll see what happens. So when that happened, then that was the proof that musicians are willing to pay for that knowledge to save themselves, I guess, the time and the energy um, that it may take if they try and figure it out themselves. I think it's, and that's the great thing about where music is going. I think, you know, on an optimistic sort of look at it all, you know, bands are understanding that, you know, you got to be multi-skilled these days. There's a lot of great musicians out there artistically and can, and can play their instruments, sing, perform, but it's, it's a very entrepreneurial, you know, domain to be in. And you have to, you know, either surround yourself with people with that have different skill sets that come together, being your other bandmates, um, or yourself, you're, you're multi-dimensional in, in your skill set. And so I think now people are starting to see this is kind of, well, it is, it's a business, you know, for those people that want to look to take it to the next level. And so I think as soon as people start to look at it that way, then they start to think, well, what do businesses do to try and get better? And they start applying that to, to their, to their craft. And, but it's a very hard thing to change if you've been doing it for a long time as well, because just it's the, the whole industry has changed so much over the past, even over the past, you know, four or five years, let alone the de last decade. So it's, yeah. um, it's very it, it's cool to see that it's going in that direction. And obviously every single band that decides to pay for one of those packages up front is another validation that, you know, it's going in that direction. And that band can also spread the word to say, I've, I've invested, this is the results. It's been positive and other bands should do it. And we all, we all feed off each other. Word of mouth is a big thing. And that's where the trust comes from our peers. So it's, um, it's, it's cool to see that that bands are reacting in that way. Yeah. And if you think about it as well, like back in the day, people were paying managers or managers were taking 20% of their fees anyway. So essentially hiring a consultant is, you know, sort of like a manager for less commitment. So you would kind of be spending that money anyway, if it was the old music industry, whether, you know, you work with a manager or a booking late. A, lab a booking label, a booking agent or a label or whatever the case may be. But now that people are kind of taking matters into their own hands and doing it themselves, I guess, you know, it's just kind of a shift in um, where the investment's going. And at the end of the day, I'm such a strong believer in teach a man to fish um, rather than, you know, take over and let someone manage um, your band or your business for you. I believe that until a certain point, there's absolutely bands can do it themselves. And if they just have the skills, then it kind of, I guess, ends up, you know, saving them time and money in the long run if they can just be taught the skills and then um, not have those gatekeepers in the way controlling their careers. It's a big, it's a big thing. Uh, you know, the control that a lot of bands didn't have over the, over the past several decades with their music through different types of contracts and, and agreements and publishing, etc. And these days, you know, a lot of it's in-house, a lot of it's DIY and 
it's great to, you know, now you can pay for a contractor, a consultant to come in, as you said, you know, pay, pay a one-off fee or pay for a, you know, a designated period of time. And then that's it. You move on and, and continue to do what you do, retain everything that you, you own and not have to worry about giving up anything apart from a bit of time and a bit of money. And it's just as, you know, as you said, that you need to do for yourself as a shift in mindset of the way that you sort of approached it and the way that you viewed it all. And if you can convince yourself, then it's a hell of a lot easier to convince other people because you, <laughs> it's, it's easier to talk, talk the talk when, uh, when you really believe in, in what you do. Absolutely. Definitely. So the blog's been up for a year. You've been doing this sort of work for past 18 months or so. Things are going really well. I mean, I've, you know, you've been on my other podcast. I've been on your podcast. You're, you're popping up everywhere and in circles that even I went, oh, that's interesting. That's a person that I wouldn't normally expect to be showing any interest in this type of stuff is, you know, sharing some of your content as well. And it's just, you're going, you're going in the right direction, but have you got any blue sky sort of goals of where you want to go? Uh, well, first of all, that's really, really cool that you say that because when you're kind of on this side of it, you never know. I mean, you can see, you know, who's sharing your content. You can see the hits on your website and whatnot, but it really does help when um, someone actually says to you that um, your content's popping up. So um, that's awesome. Mm. But in terms of long-term plans, um, I mean, I just love this stuff. I just want to keep talking about it and teaching it and learning about it myself um, for as long as possible. So, um, I mean, as I said at the start, I really wanted a business that could not only help my peers because um, I suppose one of the catalysts as well, pretty much the main reason why I'm doing this is because a lot of my friends um, that I went to uni with and that I was friends with um, over the years have quit music because they became frustrated that they weren't getting the exposure that they um, that they wanted. And, you know, they were amazing musicians. It was just they didn't have the business skills, I suppose, to um, progress to that next level. And, um so that was, that's, you know, my ultimate <laughs> mission at the end of the day, uh, whatever that looks like. I don't know if it will be more books probably because I love writing, as I said. Um, but yeah, I guess um, at the moment I am still working a day job part time. Um, so in the foreseeable future, that will be phased out. And um, yeah, hopefully some speaking overseas, that would be amazing. And I guess just spreading the word and um encouraging and inspiring other musicians to put their art out there. And I think there's so much potential there. You've explained that why before, and it's really, really important because I think everybody needs, they need that why. You need to know why you're doing what you're doing. And obviously you you come from music, you're passionate about it, you love it, you, you and you enjoy the marketing side of things, you enjoy this business side of things, you can see the potential there, but to have that, that underpin of a, of a story there where you, you know, you've come from this place where a lot of people that you've cared about and peers, you know, that you've, you've grown up with in music have you know, made decisions to move on and just give up and potentially missed out on a lot of great opportunities to, to sort of take that and run with it and go, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can to, to help as many people as possible. That's, that's a really cool thing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy, but uh, a lot of, uh, you know, with the feedback that I've been getting, hopefully, yeah, can keep making a difference, I guess. Excellent. So where's the best place for people to go? Yeah, sure. So I love Instagram. I'm like obsessed with Instagram. <laughs> so it's just find me Monica Stride on Instagram. I also have a Facebook group called Music Marketing and Mindset for Heavy Bands and Musicians. So um, definitely come on over there if you're a musician yourself, even though it is geared towards heavy musicians. Um, it's, you know, definitely stuff that can be applied to everyone in terms of marketing. And yeah, that's pretty much the two main ways. Oh, I've just started using Twitter as well. So oh, look out, I'll find you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely come be my friend on Twitter because I don't have that many people to tweet right now. So <laughs> Monica, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's so cool to, to see what you're doing. And I just, you know, we've, we've spoken about it before where, you know, a lot of the, that imposter syndrome stuff and trying to basically beat yourself, you know, trying to get past your own, your own worries, your own insecurities, and just put yourself out there and just run with it and see what happens. And, and you're doing it and, you know, just learning as you go and you're doing, doing amazing things. So just 
keep it up. I think it's it's really inspiring. It's inspiring for me just doing all my own stuff. And, and I think a lot of other people are, are obviously feeding off uh, your momentum that you're creating yourself. So it's really cool. Oh, thank you so much. To learn more about Monica Strutt, click through to the show notes on your podcast player, or you can head over to selfstarter.com.au where you will find more details from our guest as well as my key takeaways. Number one, be coachable. Monica took a large and critical step in her own development by investing in a business coach. Leaning on others who have had their own success, Monica was able to get guidance and possibly, more importantly, be held accountable to her own goals and actions. Monica admitted that it was an expense that needed to be considered. However, she can confidently say that it's been worth it in allowing her to grow, get better, and achieve her business goals. Number two, too busy to get stuff done. Monica spoke about how she, like many of us, falls into the procrastination trap and finds herself doing a lot of, and I'll use the quotes, busy work. In other words, keeping busy with tasks that serve little purpose to the bigger goals. Don't worry about the 20 dot point to-do list. Start your days off with three to four main action items. You'll get far more meaningful work done. As coined in the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papperson, the question that's always asked is, what's the one thing I can do that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? Remember folks, keep it simple and tackle those critical items first. Number three, creating advocates. By using her name as the branding of the business, Monica certainly puts a degree of vulnerability out into the public domain. The benefit, however, is that she can build deep trust and loyalty from her audience as it's easier to connect and relate to Monica as a person as well as her mission. This creates a natural advocate who's quick to talk positively and, when it arises, defends unnecessary criticism that Monica may receive. Corporations spend huge sums of money in their marketing in the hope of creating brand advocates. Monica is creating this herself by being herself. And number four, what's your mission? What's your story? We know that a story behind a business is really important. Monica's background as a musician and her experiences watching people give up on their dreams has created a foundation to her cause and mission. When people can see why you're doing something and those origins, it's easier for people to connect, relate, and most importantly, support. We're done. To learn more about this episode and previous ones, check out selfstarter.com.au. If you want to have a sticky beak at my other podcast, the Andy Social Podcast or the Ben Lord, or anything else that's happening in my neck of the woods, you can go over to andydowling.net. Looking forward to having you back for the next episode of Self Starter. Larry.